You know, sometimes you just need to be reminded what God's like and who He is. And uh, I don't know why, but today was that day for me. So, um, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Acts chapter 2. Um, you just put your finger there. We're going through the series, Find Your Moment. And today we want to find our moment with each other. We're talking about finding those moments with God, those what we call a watershed moment here, just those life-changing moments, those moments where God becomes real, where your life is changed, um, where you are changed because of God and because of meeting with Him and experiencing Him in a very real way. And part of how that happens, we believe here, uh, is, is that we are connected with each other. In fact, I, I think I got it up on the screen. It's our, uh, our second... Um, core values to be connected or relationship driven. It says this, we will grow in Christ through a multiplying biblical community, warm fellowship, and by helping build strong families. That's that's part of what we do here. It's, it's part of, of attaining our vision of, of introducing people to Jesus, making disciples, and flooding the world with God's love. This is one of the ways that we do that. I just got a question for you. Have you ever thought about everything that has to go into meeting a person and becoming their friend. Think about everything that goes into that happening. Think about how we connect with others and all the different things that have to fall in place. Let me give you an example. I was born in Missouri, and in Missouri, in a little town called Chaffee, Missouri, uh, right on the Mississippi River. Uh, my family lived in Illinois, though. Missouri just happened to be the closest hospital. That's how rural the area was where my family lived in Illinois, just across on the other side of the Mississippi River. So uh, my mom and dad had to go to Missouri for me to be born. So I was born in Missouri. Uh, we lived in Illinois for a little bit. After there, we moved to Missouri. We lived in like two different cities in Missouri. Then my dad's job. My dad was actually a pastor for a short period of time in, in Missouri. Um, and that just wasn't for him. He realized that wasn't going to work out for him. Um, and so they moved into Tennessee where he stole life insurance. And it was back in the days where he would literally take the car and, and go and wouldn't come home until he sold a lot of life insurance policies until, you know, that he had, he'd make enough to pay the bills for that week. And it was, it was a very hard life on my mom. She had me and my sister was born. And uh, my sister, you know, were very young. My dad was on the road constantly. And, and finally, he got a new job and moved from Jackson, Tennessee, which is a very small town, uh, to Knoxville, Tennessee, which is a little bit bigger. And I lived there for a long time and then moved to North Carolina. I know you don't care about all this, but just bear with me. Well, I'll go somewhere with it, I promise. Lived in Knoxville until I was in middle school, then went to North Carolina. I went to three different middle schools, uh, all, in different, all in different cities. So halfway through my sixth grade year, I moved from Knoxville to North Carolina, just outside of Raleigh. Then uh, at the end of my seventh grade year, I moved from North Carolina to Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, went to eighth grade there and, and eventually graduated uh, from high school in Memphis, Tennessee. So I've lived in a lot of places. And there's some other little towns, like suburb towns in those areas where I live. Um, but I'll never forget, um, my summer between my seventh and eighth grade year, we moved to Tennessee. My family always went to church. That was a thing in my life. God and church were always really important. And so we, no matter where we went, there was always a church family that we were a part of. My dad made sure that we were in church. That was important to him. And so we moved to Memphis like in May, right after the school year ended. We moved from North Carolina to Memphis. And uh, we got plugged into a church right away. We started going to that church. We went there all summer long. And I quickly made a lot of friends. Like I was really uh, upset about moving from North Carolina. I was at that age where I'd made friends there and kind of making a life. And, and uh, I was really mad at my parents. I was mad at God that we had to move. And so we got plugged into this church and actually made friends really quickly and was really enjoying myself. And then my dad all of a sudden decided that he wanted to go to a different church in town, in Memphis. And I was like, then I was really mad. I was like, why in the world would you do this? Like, you just moved me away from all my friends I'm making new friends, and now you're saying, no, we're going to go to another church that's like halfway across town, totally away from these people. And uh, so I was really, really angry at that. But something happened. He called, there, there was a youth pastor on staff at this church. He called him, said, hey, my son's struggling. 
do you mind coming and talking to him? So he came and visited me in my house. His name is Greg House. We're still good friends to this day. Came and talked to me in my house and just talked to me about what I'm feeling and said, hey, why don't you come just try us out? Our youth group meets on Wednesday nights. Why don't you just come try us out and see what it's like? And I, I think you might have a good time. So I did. So I, I went and I walked in the room. And I had already started playing. It was like two days. By this time, it's August. Two days for football. So I was playing football. So I met some guys on the football team. I walked in the room. There was like three guys from the football team. So I'm thinking, oh, good. I know someone. But then I'm hanging out with these guys. And I look across the room. And lo and behold, there stands this beautiful, beautiful girl. Brown hair, tan, like just drop dead gorgeous. And I asked the guys. I was like, guys, who is that girl over there? Like, oh, her? That's Christy Bella. I was like, really? I was like, can you introduce me to her? Like, yeah, sure, we can introduce you. So they walked me over and introduced me to this girl. And it was like all of a 10 second, oh, hi. Yeah, and they're like, hey, this is Eric. He's new in town. She's like, oh, hi. I'm like, good to meet you. And it was kind of it. But that was the beginning of the relationship of the girl who's now my wife. And, you know, I think about all the things that went into us meeting. How many different places did I live? How many different jobs did my dad have to have? How many different promotions and transfers did he have to get for me to end up at church, at that church, on that night to meet Christy? Like there's a lot of things that go into all that. And you can call it fate. You can call it uh, circumstance. You can call it coincidence. I don't believe in any of those things. I believe it's 100% God ordained. I'm not saying all those moves had only me in mind, but it definitely had me included in what my future would be and what Christy's future would be. I mean, if it wasn't for all those things falling in line, Christy and I would not be here today more than likely. Our children definitely wouldn't be here. There's all these things. And you can think about that with any of your relationships. When you think about what are the chances of you meeting the people that you meet. In our passage today, we see one relationship that had a massive domino effect for all the other relationships in one group of people's lives. And in fact, we're still feeling that domino effect today, even though this happened 2,000 years ago. So I pick it up in Acts chapter 2, and the, the words will be on the board there on the screens. Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 38, it says this, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for all your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call. With many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and there were about 3,000 people were added to them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all, as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day... The Lord had added to their number those who were being saved. Like I said, last week we talked about this already. We did the discovery group. But, man, i got to tell you, like this hasn't left my head. It hasn't left my heart. There's just so much here to talk about. So we're just going to dive right in. One of the, one of the first things that, that I noticed was the word devoted. In verse 42 it says, they devoted themselves. And there, there was four things that they devoted themselves to. The teaching fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayer. And I just The definition for devoted, I, I wanted to look it up just to kind of really get the feeling. It means very loving or loyal. It also means given to the display, study, and discussion of it. This means that they became among the most important things in their lives. So when they devoted themselves to teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer, that means that these things became what was most important to them what they spent most of their time doing, what they cared about the most. You know, I, I think about this. We, we, what we are devoted to is important to us. You know, I, I think of an obituary. When someone passes away, what does, how does the obituary usually describe someone? 
they were a devoted dot dot dot. A devoted father, a devoted mother, a devoted brother, a devoted son, a devoted daughter. You know, they were devoted to some people in the game of golf. They were devoted to helping others, to raising awareness for autism, for whatever. You name it, whatever that person is devoted to, that's how the obituary reads. Why? Because what you're devoted to matters. And it should matter to other people. And that's what you want to be known for. Like, that's the one thing. Like, if you had a sense of pride, not like the negative, I'm better than you pride, but like the good pride that comes from doing the right things and doing stuff that matters, that comes from involving yourself in things that are beyond you, that are bigger than you. You want people to know what you're devoted to. So my question for us is just to stop and think for a second. What are the things that you are devoted to? What are they? I mean, it could be anything. Maybe it's family. Maybe it's work. Maybe there's a cause that you're passionate about. Maybe it's the environment. Maybe it's rights, justice. Maybe it's God and the church. What is it that you're devoted to? You see, Jesus entered people's lives, and they instantly became devoted to these four things. The moment Jesus entered their lives, their devotion, I don't know what it was before, I don't know what track it was, but the instant that Jesus came into these people's lives, their devotion moved from whatever it was to these four things, to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So we're just going to kind of go through and talk about these things real quick. The first thing was teaching. It says this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Listen, to devote yourself to teaching means that they listened, learned, and applied what they were taught. They listened, learned, and applied what they were taught. You know, to devote yourself to teaching means first that you've got to be teachable. I think a lot of us struggle with being teachable. Me, first and foremost. Like, we've lived long enough, everyone in this room has lived long enough to where you have things figured out in your head and in your heart, right? Like, you've thought about it. It's not that you haven't thought about it. You have thought about it. It's not that you don't have life experiences. We all have life experiences. And sometimes... I find that the more life experiences we have, and the more we think about a subject, the less teachable we become because we have our hearts and our minds made up. We have a way of life. Maybe we've experienced some kind of hurt, and we've become callous towards learning in a certain direction because, man, last time I tried doing that, I ended up hurt. So we protect ourselves from that. So the first thing that we have to do to devote ourselves to sound teaching is to be teachable. And that isn't to say that you're a mindless robot. That doesn't mean to say that every time you come to church or listen to someone preach, they just automatically take absolutely everything they say to the bank. I mean, we make mistakes as pastors. The people who teach you, no matter how great their intentions are, make mistakes. And sometimes people have really horrible intentions. And they teach you falsely on purpose. So it's not to say that we're a mindless robot, but it is to say that we should seriously weigh what we're being taught and see what the truth is compared to God's Word, and then apply that truth to our lives. You need to find someone and somewhere from whom you can be taught about God. Now, this passage doesn't give specifics, but one can assume based on the commands that Jesus gave His disciples that the apostles are teaching these people to obey everything Jesus commanded them. Because right before Jesus left this earth, what did He say? Go and make disciples teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you, right? So we can assume that that happened. And it's also evidenced by the way that the people are beginning to live out their lives. These people's lives are changed, and that's evidence of what they're being taught because they're devoted for the teaching. Their lives look different. So who are you allowing to teach you? You are here today. That's great. I, like, I don't take the fact that I stand up here every week lightly. It's, it's a very big deal. I take it very seriously. Because I'm hopefully giving you something that is true. That lines up with what God's trying to teach us and what God's trying to show us. And if you're going to take what I say and apply it somehow to your lives, then I want it to be good teaching. I want it to be something that you can be devoted to. But you know, I'm not the only source for teaching. Maybe there's a pastor you listen to podcasts online or listen to certain radio programs, listen to certain music, like the music that we listen to. You know, I mean, there's a great radio station in our city, 106.9. You can listen to this all the time. And we can learn 
through the Psalms. But you need to be devoted to teaching to some place, someone, and somewhere who can teach you. Maybe it is watershed. Maybe you're looking somewhere else. But what we need to do is we need to find a, a place, a church that believes that the Bible is the inerrant Word of God and, and that believes in following Jesus' command and devote ourselves to that place. God wants us to be devoted to a church, to a people. I believe that we do a pretty good job of that here. I think we're doing, we're all on the right track. So they devoted themselves to apostle teaching. The second thing is, one kind of lumped two and together, they devoted themselves to fellowship and to the breaking of the bread. You know, I, I think all this, everything that they devoted themselves to happens in the context of togetherness. It really happens in the context of being with others. All these people were brought together by their common belief that Jesus is the Son of God risen from the dead and their common experience of repenting from their sins and being baptized. That brought everyone together. 3,000 people all brought together by that common belief and that common experience. And salvation brings you together with people you would never know otherwise. Our relationship with Jesus is the great uniter. It unites across all races, nationalities, gender, socioeconomic status, age, ideologies, you name it. Jesus brings people together. You know, I wouldn't know a single one of you in here were it not for Jesus. I mean, none of us would know each other. Nick and I lived 20 minutes apart. We lived 20 minutes apart in Mississippi. I never met him until I moved up here. Can you believe that? Isn't that crazy? Like we never, we never knew each other. We knew, we know so many of the same people, but we never knew each other. I moved up here to start this church, and I know each and every one of you because of that. I know my children because my family knew Jesus Christ, and we went to gather together with other people who knew Jesus Christ to worship Him, and I met my wife there. And she was there because her family had accepted Jesus Christ, repented from their sins, and was baptized, and she was there to worship God the way I was there to worship God. And somewhere along the line, her parents met Jesus. And my dad was introduced to Jesus by my grandmother. And somewhere along the line, someone introduced my grandmother to Jesus. And I know for a fact that my grandmother was introduced to Jesus by my great-grandmother. And somewhere along the line, someone introduced her to Jesus. I could go on forever. I'm done. But you get the point. Like Jesus brings us all together in a way no one else can. Jesus doesn't have a ripple effect on your relationships. It's more like a tsunami that changes absolutely everything in its path. And it's not just that you have these new relationships with Jesus, it's the type of relationship that you have. These people were devoted to one another. This isn't just like, hey, how you doing? How's the weather? This isn't just like, let's get together for a quick potluck and only talk about the game. Like those things are great. Like I do talk about those things. I probably talked about those things with each of you today. But man, it goes so much deeper than that. This was the ultimate, I got your back. And I know that you got mine. This passage says they were generous. What does it say? They had all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. They were generous. They were selfless. They were intimate. They were intimate. Look, it says every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple. And they broke bread from house to house. Man, there's something about sharing a meal together. Like, I just don't share meals with complete strangers usually, right? Like, it'd be weird if you walked over to someone's table. If you go to, out to eat today after church and you just go to a complete stranger's table and you sit down and start eating with them, right? Or if you invite them to come eat with you. You don't, why? Because you don't know them like that. Like, they're not friends like that with you, right? Like, it's, you know, you just don't do it. But man, when you eat a meal together, that's another level of intimacy. And they were reliant on each other. They depended on one another to get through the day, to get through the week, to get through the month. You know, as they were together in, in public, like they went to the temple every day, they were together in private, they went from house to house, breaking bread, and they encouraged each other spiritually as well as materially. They were so devoted to each other that they would sell what they had to provide for each other's needs. 
And, so, and like, here, here's the example I thought of. It's like if someone in this fellowship needed a car to get back and forth to work. Like, for whatever reason, public transit didn't work. Like, I got to get a car so I can get this job. And then someone else maybe is driving, let's just say, a BMW. Like, a really nice new BMW. They got pretty good money. It's like they go sell their BMW, buy themselves a little Honda. Nothing wrong with the Honda, but it's a little less expensive than BMW, right? Buy themselves a used Honda and give the difference to the other person so they can buy a car. That's the type of stuff that was going on. Now, I don't know about you, but that can be difficult for me sometimes. Like, I kind of like my money. Let's just be real. We all do. We all like to have a certain comfort level. There's a certain status level that we're all kind of used to. That's part of our culture. No matter how high or low it is, like, there's a minimum status that we feel comfortable with in our lives. Is that right? That's right. But, man, they didn't care about their status. They cared about each other. They didn't care about what they had. They cared about who they were with. And they were willing to go to great lengths to make sure that they took care of one another. They had meals together. They had fun together. Look at the, look at the passage here, Grace. You can bring it up at the very end. It says, They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the, fa enjoying the favor of all the people. Man. It's so important that we have fun together. And look, if it's not fun to be with other believers, we're missing half the point. And I feel like we do a pretty good job. Like, like neighborhood group has been great this, this past semester. Like, it's just been amazing. Uh, we all went to the Creamery on Wednesday night. Had a great time there. And we, like, we really enjoy one another's company. Their reputation was outstanding. It says they had favor with all the people. In other words, everyone noticed that there was something different about them. Everyone noticed how great they were, how joyful they were, how loving they were. And they weren't a click. It says that God added to the number daily those who were being saved. You know, in John, um, Angel, I'm going to ask you to come, up, come on up. In the book of John, it talks about, Jesus tells his disciples, he said, people will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. And as a church, we want to be loving towards one another. And we want to be open. It's not just about only making some great tight friends here where we can rely on each other and have each other's back. Right here, right now, it's about including anyone who wants to come be a part of this fellowship. Anyone who wants to trust Jesus. Like It's all about that. In fact, if you notice, that seems to be the outcome of the devotion of the first church. The outcome of people being devoted to good teaching. The outcome of people being devoted to fellowship and breaking bread together. The outcome of people being devoted to prayer was that more people came and joined in. You know, that's the last thing is the power of prayer. They believed that the power of prayer and they prayed together. Why did they put so much important in prayer? Because they saw it working. It says that they were in awe of the signs and wonders that the apostles were performing. I believe that's a direct result of prayer. Guys, I'm not going to belabor the prayer because we talked about that a lot this year. But God wants to do something great for this church. He's going to use our unity and togetherness and our prayers to make that happen. You know, when Chrissy and I just had to move, a lot, most of you know this, and we were praying about how where God would put us because our, our landlord is selling our house. And we found out we're staying in an Airbnb right now. Like we're praying for a place to stay until school is over for the kids. And this Airbnb wasn't an Airbnb when we first started looking for a place to stay. The lady was putting in the furniture and turning her apartment into an Airbnb at the exact same time we were praying for a place to stay. God works through our prayers. So we want to be connected with each other in a real meaningful way here at Watershed. We want to be a part of something that is bigger than ourselves. You know, in California, all along the coast, there's redwood trees. They're 350 feet tall, some of the tallest ones, 2,500 years old. You know how they can grow so tall and live so long? It's because when the roots spread out, they all intertangle and intertwine and work together to anchor each other into the ground and to gather the nutrients that they all need. 
As a church, we will only thrive as long as we're connected with each other. So we want to learn what that looks like. Let's join in. Let's do it together. Let's be devoted together. The first step is to be joined together with Jesus Christ. To believe that He's the Son of God, that He died on the cross for our sins. To repent, that means turn away from your sins and to follow Jesus. The second step is to be baptized. To follow through with baptism after you believe in Jesus Christ. To be baptized into the fellowship. That's what happened here in the book of Acts. And the third step is to plug into the church. Sunday mornings, neighborhood group, discovery group. What's God calling you to do today? Let's pray. God, we love you. Lord, we thank you so much for this example from the other church. Lord, I'm just... God, I'm in awe of how they were devoted to each other. God, forgive me if I haven't been devoted to my friends, to my family, to God's family the way I should be. God, just give me that heart that comes from you that's supernaturally changed by the love that your son Jesus Christ showed us on the cross. God, help me to be devoted to my brothers and sisters in your Jesus Christ, in your son Jesus Christ. And God, help my brothers and sisters to be devoted, devoted to one another. And God, may the world see our love for each other and know that we're your disciples. And God, may you add number daily to the number that are being saved. God, may you change Roxboro through our devotion to you and to each other. God, whatever you call us to do today, I pray that we do it, that we obey you, and that we follow Jesus' commands. We love you and praise things in Jesus' name. Amen. We stand together.